Hello everyone, welcome to a very special episode from Ampro Engineering. In this episode, we are going to talk about my second most influential RC car of all time, the Tayo Baja Bandit. Just marvel in the beauty that is the Tyco Baja Bandit. So this is one of the versions of the Bandit. There were two variants of this. In its first year, you had your 27 band version, which was the red with the yellow lettering. And then you had your 49 band version, which was yellow with the red lettering. Same black body, same chrome window. It was just the decals that differentiated the two cars. And the battery door opened, but that's a pretty good idea of what we should look at next. So to open and close the door, there's this little rotating little arm here. The red dial is what will help you to trim your steering servo to go as straight as you possibly can. And when this car was purchased brand new in the box, you also got a couple of these little, I guess I'll call them tie rod ends, they're little plastic clips that I don't know if they broke or fell off, but you did usually get those. So with the door opened, this will reveal the 9.6 volt battery pack mounting location. This was a huge deal when this thing came out. Prior to the 9.6V rechargeable battery, most RC cars required AA batteries that we purchased, either an alkaline or NICAD versions, which would require a charger. This car came with one of these rechargeable battery packs, as well as a four hour, very, very slow charger. Now to my recollection, the car did come with the battery charger. This is the four hour quick charger. And yes, there were many cases where the charger took far more than four hours. In some cases, as far as 24 hours. So there you go, you'd plug that into the wall and you would uh, anxiously stare at it for the next four hours until this was warm and ready to throw back in your car for a blistering eight minutes and then back to the four hour charging it did come with the molex connectors to plug them in better known now as the quote unquote tamiya connector let's go ahead and install the battery usually i wouldn't do this but i wanted to show how much fun this actually was the first thing you would want to do is take the battery door off and you can do that because it has a little notch right here so slide the door off then we'll come in and I'm specifically using the original Tyco battery, but not this mint one. We'll use this perhaps more accurate representation of how one of these would look after 500 charges. So we'll plug that on in. Okay, and then you'll want to jam this whole set into the hole. And then this will go over that. And then you'll see that there's still too much cable in here. So you just kind of want to jam it in there the best you can. You remember that this isn't really possible to be done by an adult. It can only really be assembled by an eight-year-old. So we're just going to wedge it in there the best we can, which is not really in there. And then we're going to somehow squeeze that in. And if it's half falling out, you're on the right track. Needless to say, the battery installation on this was always problematic. It was as if Tyco had the form factor of this particular set of double A's and then said, well, we can kind of wedge it in here and then did just that. They kind of made it fit. Now, all joking aside, the battery does fit, but it is definitely unpleasant to put in here and takes quite a lot of effort. Then you just close that, power the car on with this switch right here and snag your remote. The remote is also a thing of beauty. Uh, unfortunately, this is the best remote I have, which other than missing these two decals is in mint condition. You have your Tyco RC badging here, and just please note that Tyco didn't actually produce any RC cars. Tyco simply rebranded them. You see underneath the car, we see Tyco RC made by Tayo in Singapore. Tayo was the manufacturer of these cars. Tyco was just the advertising powerhouse that got children to simply salivate at the sight of this car. One of my favorite aspects of the radio, and uh, just, just a note here, this should be an on and off decal, and this one here said turbo. What does that mean? Well, when we hit the power switch, we have the LED that comes on to tell us that's power. Here we can make the car go forward, and this is a single speed. And here is full left and full right. No proportional controls. Or are there? 
Even though there aren't proportional controls that we're used to, there was another setting for the throttle which would engage this light. And there'll be an audible click, and now you're in turbo. Basically, this car's speed controller had a slow and a fast setting, which would mean you'd be buzzing the car around in slow, racing against your buddies that didn't have the 9.6V power, and then uh, they'd be catching up to you and you would just pop that baby in turbo and you were gone. That was not the only way to increase speed of the vehicle. If we turn the car around, we can see that we have a two-speed transmission that has a slow speed and a fast speed. And there is a significant difference in these two speeds, which we will see a little bit later on. When the Tyco Bandit first came out, the body that you see here, the Nissan hard body, also known as the D21, was brand spanking new. Now the D21 came out in 1987, and I believe it's actually like a 1986 and a half model year introduction. I do not know, however, what year the Bandit was introduced. This is some of the very little documentation that I have on the Bandit. And as you note by the image here, this is for the first generation of the Bandit. I was hoping to see a date on this, and unfortunately I cannot find one anywhere. Here we can see the two part numbers denoting 27 band or 49 band, and then some notes on the chassis. You can see here the charger and the battery that were included with the kit. And if anybody wants to see these, just go ahead and pause conserve these images. I would like to say that this bandit came out between 87 and 89. This particular bandit is the first generation of the bandit. And we'll dive into what makes a first gen versus a second and a third generation vehicle. Number one is the livery. As I mentioned earlier, you had two choices on the color for these very, you know, I think very neat looking striped decals. And even the lettering, the font, just gave this car kind of a wild look to it. Brand new, this car would have had lots and lots of bright, shiny chrome. This particular example is not in bad shape, but the chrome has perished over the years. It does have the Baja style rear mounted tire with no tailgate. I don't really know what this scoopy thing here is on the roof. I never really cared for it. These should be a beautiful chrome. In fact, I'm going to send this out to have it replated uh, as, again, these have perished over the years. The car did have a rear suspension, which was nicely sprung. I wouldn't call it too stiff, nor would I call it too light. I think it's spot on for what it should actually be on this car. It has a rear suspension exactly like that of the Tamiya Grasshopper, where it only pivots about this point here. The front end is just like the Tamiya Grasshopper, where you have the spring right here on a little plastic molded tower. This chassis was also used on the turbo hopper, which is why this little molded shock tower is molded the way it is. It was designed to be visible on the turbo hopper. And when you compress the suspension, you are gonna see magnificent camber gain. This vehicle actually has quite a lot of bump steer as well. So well played. Again, this isn't some professional race car. This is just a toy and what a toy it was. You had your auxiliary lamps, these have seen better days. An absolutely beautiful molded plastic body on this. This is not painted. This is simply molded in black. This version also has no differential. Okay, let's make a note of that. It's hard to tell how soft the tires are supposed to be. These are quite stiff uh, and I would hesitate to squeeze them very hard as that's one of the most common problems with the Tyco Bandit today is rotted tires. This again is our first generation. Let's move on to our second gen. Our second generation car is right here. Now ignore the red body, they also did make a version of this that was black, which we'll see on the third generation car. One thing I did want to note is that I have removed the windshield on purpose because one of the changes that they made is gave the vehicle a light up indicator. So here we can see that the windshield is completely chrome. On this car here, it would have been black like this, but they also added this light pipe right here, which told you when the car was on. So I just wanted to note that because I think it was a very neat little addition. And you can see how close it comes to the roof because again, this chassis was used in a different car and they just put the truck body on it. The second generation car did also change the paint scheme quite a lot. Gone was this very subtle, I think, paint scheme. And in was a very late 80s, early 90s neon paint scheme. Personally, I really like it. I know that a lot of people prefer the early generation car, but I happen to think this is really neat looking. Again, it's from the 90s. It should look like it was from the 90s. This is our high band version, our 49 megahertz. 
And our 27 megahertz would have had a slightly different coloration on the stickers and a black body. Everything is just about the same on both cars except for one key feature. This car here, again, will have our standard rear suspension, but also notice the transmission does in fact articulate just like the Hornet did. So basically it is a rolling rigid rear axle like the Hornet. This does also have a fast and slow gear selection on the transmission. One other addition that this vehicle has that the first one does not is a differential. These are incredibly noticeable when you drive it. This car turns quite a lot better than the other car does. However, you are going to lose a little bit of off-road performance because this thing is undoubtedly going to get stuck a lot easier. So this is our second generation car, but we are not done. For our third generation car, we have what looks exactly like the second generation car. Just in passing, the decals are the exact same color. The red injection molded body is the exact same color. Ignore the 3D printed front bumper that is an Ampro product that is simply not painted yet. Even from the side, we really cannot see any kind of difference. They look exactly the same. This is a little bit nicer from the rear. Same rear bumper, same taillights, nearly the same vehicle. However, if we do this, we can immediately see a difference. So the second generation car and the first generation car have this body. But for the third generation vehicle, we have an all new transmission. A transmission whose gear selector is on top. So now we're in, it's hard to see it there, but now we're in slow. Actually, I'm sorry, we're in fast in this case. We push the button down, slide it over to slow, and now we're in slow. Question is, do we have a diff or not? And we do not. We've gone back to the non-differential rear axle because most likely the benefit for off-road outweigh the benefit for on-road. I do want to show the variation of this body for the 27 band version. So that is what you would get with a 27 band. This one again is missing the front bumper. We do have the chrome window as well as the LED that pokes through the glass on this third gen, just like the second gen. You can see here on the fast tracks body that same cutout in the rear, except that this one here doesn't have any kind of brace on this stud. If you look closely at this variation here, you can see that this has a diagonal brace. What's funny is that as these toys matured, modifications were made to make them stronger. So even though these two are both third generation cars, even this one here doesn't have that diagonal brace. I do believe at this time here, you probably want to see the cars running. So let's go do that. I'm going to sit right here. Much more time to see us. Okay, I'm ready. I'm going to go. Yeah. Yep, go. Stop! Slow, at low speed. Well, I just want to record this. It's nine kilometers per hour. Now it's going to high speed. Twelve. To put it in fast now. For slow and fast. That's 15 kilometers per hour. What is that? Ten miles an hour? You can line them up if you want.
is fast on the trans, but low on the radio. Watch how fast it's gonna go, okay? We're gonna do a speed run. Ready? Oh, who doesn't? And let's go. I'll share with you. Share with me. Do it first, and then I do it. Driving this truck was really a time warp for me. I never owned one of these in new condition. The only two that I ever had were in horrendous shape when I purchased them used as a child. But the feeling of driving this truck after all these years, the way it was designed originally really brought everything back to me. And with that said, the question is, do you want one? I'm really going to only address the collector here because I cannot imagine that there is any other market for this vehicle. There are a few things to note when looking for one of these cars. If you are a very hardcore collector with quite deep pockets, get yourself a new inbox one. They're going to set you back a fortune. If you are a collector looking to relive his youth with one of these cars, go ahead and find yourself a bandit. Which one? It doesn't matter which one's more desirable, even though this one here probably is the most desirable of the three generations. The one that you want to get is the one that you had or wanted when you were little. For me, it's this one here. It's the Black Bandit with the ridiculous 1990s paint scheme. This was the car that I saw on commercials as a kid and I had to have. Get one in great shape, not in good shape because usually ones in good shape still have rotted tires. And as of the filming of this video, it is not economically feasible to replace and 3D print the tires. It will be soon, but as of right now, that is simply not the case. So you're going to want to spend between $150 and $200 and get yourself a solid operational example of one of these. The reason I say operational is that is 90% of the fun of this car. Yes, it looks great, but just driving this thing around was so much more of a flashback than just parking this thing on a shelf. You are able to get modern batteries. This one here is a couple years old and I believe it, yes, this is a nickel metal hydride. So slightly lower voltage than a, a NICAD, but still it's gonna fit in the proper location and it's much, much larger than the old NICAD batteries. Things to look out for, antennas. These are notoriously fragile. So if yours has got a broken antenna, you may find some issues with that and finding a replacement. As I mentioned earlier, tires. It is very hard to find tires for these cars, so make sure that you get one with good tires. If the $150 to $200 range for a nice one is out of the question, you can still get them for under $100, bucks, but you're looking at getting one with a lot of work. Uh, trouble spots include but are not limited to the front shock tower simply shearing off, the rear shock mounts back here in the body breaking off, and that means you lose the front spring, you lose the rear spring, you lose the upper shock mount, there's a lot of issues with these cars when they're heavily abused. Bumpers in the front are usually first to go, especially with the uh, auxiliary lights. We do offer replacement 3D printed front bumpers, rear bumpers, as well as the roll bar that we've got here. The little scoop thing that goes on the roll bar. These auxiliary lights are just removable. So if you do break one, you can just replace one of these. Even in terms of decals, you should be all set. MCI Racing out of Canada makes the Bandit logos. I know they make these. I'm not entirely certain that these exist yet, but uh, if there's enough demand, they can easily make a set of these because obviously you just make one and then recolor it for the other ones. The Tyco Bandit is very special to me. Like I said, this was the second most influential car that I've ever had. And in fact, it was important enough for me to spend quite 
a lot of time on building Project Bandit over here. This thing, uh, if you've not seen the build on this, it was quite involved, but for me, it was worth it because the Tyco Bandit is one of the greatest RC cars ever made. And it did come out in the golden age of RCs. I don't like the fact that the quote unquote toy grade RCs tend to get glossed over because these were as important to the hobby grade RC cars as entry level hobby grade RC cars. Even a $150 Tamiya Grasshopper was far and above out of the reach for a lot of working class families. This was a $60 toy and although $60 is a lot more then than it is now, it was still far closer to be able to get one of these to the vast majority of youngsters as opposed to an entry level Tamiya or Kyosho or even knockoff to one of those cars. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed yourselves and we'll see you next time.